think on a personal level, we're quite friendly. We have lots in common in terms of culture, food, all of that. But in terms of the war, we actually asked that question to a number of people in Japan and China. And many people said that they try not to talk about the war because it often makes things quite awkward. So what Hainin and I had to go through for two weeks, forced to talk about the war all the time, was quite tricky. I mean, how much of a journey was that for you, traveling to Japan, hearing things that were quite confrontational, I imagine? It was my first trip to Japan. So thinking back now, I, I wish I was on that trip for a different purpose. So my impressions could be very different from now. Was it harder than you thought it would be? It was much harder than I expo ex expected because we spent the first two days you know, speaking to quite a number of nationalists, right-wing nationalists, who felt quite strongly about you know, changing the way the history has been taught in, in Japan. So it was a harsh beginning. I mean, let me take you back then to your childhoods. Mariko, what did you learn about what Japan did during the war when you were growing up? So I was in Japan, I was raised in Japan until the age of 16. So I first learned about Japan's world, world history when I was 14. And you go through from human evolution to today in one year. So I was quite interested in war history because I had a grandfather who was very uh, opinionated about the war. But I remember thinking, OK, we just spent two lessons on the entire war. And, you know, 14 years old, you're more interested in fashion and boys. You know, how are you supposed to remember all of that? So after that, I traveled across Asia, visited war museums and really strongly felt that what I learned at school wasn't enough. So I wrote an article about it, which became very, very controversial in Japan because obviously people thought that I was criticizing about my own country in front of global audience. Japan has, though, apologized to China many times. There has, that's, that's known, of course, and there's been all this Japanese financial aid, $36 billion to China. Is that something, though, that the Chinese people recognize, or is their interpretation different as well? I think there are a number of Chinese people are aware of the apologize uh, from some of the Japanese politicians occasionally and the financial aid during a certain period of time. Uh, nevertheless, you know, it, it was not taught in our history textbooks, that's for one thing, but people still have channels to learn about that part of history. But saying that, you know, the, the thing that people tend to, we, we can see some kind of uh, a protest, you know, in 26 and uh, 2012, and people say, why are you still, still so angry? after Japan has been apologized. The thing is, there is a lack of a consistency in the, you know, in the acts and the words from Japanese politicians in particular. When you apologize you know, today and went to the Yasukuni to pay respect to the war dead or war criminals, it kind of destroyed the trust or the very you know, uh, weak foundation of you know, having a conversation between the Chinese public and the Japanese public. And that's something I think we need to talk about you know, in terms of communication. And also, Mariko, even the historic facts are in dispute here. I mean, what happened in Nanjing, the two countries can't agree. Indeed. I mean, we did speak to a number of people who said that all those supposedly civilians were just guerrilla fighters who dressed as civilians. Even a little bit more moderate historian would argue that there were only 200,000 people in the city of Nanjing. So how could China claim that more than 300 was, were killed and also the Communist Party just after the war, even during the war, when they were bringing this issue up, they were citing a lot lower number. So there are a lot of controversies there. But Heining, how did it feel to be sitting there and to be told by some Japanese people that this is all wrong, that what happened in Nanjing simply didn't happen that way? I think you, when you think about whether those nationalists would talk to you in that way and we were actually in that position, it was quite different. I think it's the one thing that we have some debates about exact numbers of casualties during the Nanjing massacre. It is another when someone saying in your face that it should not be called a massacre in the first place, it should be called an incident and trying to play it down. And that's kind of the thing that will provoke the deepest uh, emotions on the back of your of your mind as a Chinese person. Do you think that today's Japanese population f should now be feeling guilt over what happened? Uh, can you repeat I that mean, question? Do you think that Mariko, that other young Japanese should feel guilty of, about what happened? I don't think Japanese people, I mean, ordinary people should, you know, feel guilty about what the soldiers and the politicians did 
some 80 years ago. That's a different question. However, for politicians, it is important for politicians, including the prime minister, to recognize that they need to face the history you know, with the honesty and with the very sincere attitude and consistency in their actions and words towards their neighboring countries and the people I in mean, those neighboring countries. I mean, countries. Marika, what are your emotions at these times? I mean, not only being at home in Japan, but when you went to China as well, did you feel a sense of, of guilt for what the people of your country once did? Or, or do, do you dispute what happened? I mean, just take us through how you felt over this time. Well, I actually visited Nanjing as a tourist. <laughs> it sounds a little bit odd, but um, I was so interested that, that I had to see the evidence myself. And what I felt there was firstly very vulnerable. I didn't want people to find out I was Japanese. So I was thinking I'll pretend I was Korean if anyone asked, um, because all the evidence was so overwhelming. And even though I knew some of the arguments that some of the photographs might be fabricated and whatnot but there was there was a section in the museum where Japanese soldiers were speaking to a Japanese journalist admitting that he killed and raped and that's when I thought it's not about the number something horrible did happen um, but this project was quite interesting in a sense that I started off criticizing our own education but we also examined if China's patriotic education plays a role in today's tensions between the two countries. You know, Heine mentioned about apologies not really taught at school, but also whether that sentiment against Japan, has it been played up in anti-Japanese war dramas on TV? So it was, it was a difficult, even watching those dramas, even though you think that, okay, maybe people won't take this seriously, but all those emotions for two weeks was quite a challenging experience. And what do you think now in terms of at a political level? I mean, Shinzo Abe once again going to the Yasakuni Shrine. Every year we see Japanese politicians visit, uh, but it is a, quite a political statement. Indeed. I mean, I actually, as part of the program, I actually went there with my own grandfather because his uncle is among the warded who is enshrined there. And I felt so torn because, I mean, the prime minister, whether you believe him or not, he would say that he's there for the war dead, the two and a half million Japanese soldiers, not the war criminals. Um, my grandfather felt very strongly that he wanted to go with me to pay respect to his uncle. So I can understand that emotions, but at the same time, I could completely understand why that would provoke very strong reactions in China. Heining, we have these pictures and these incidences of protests over the East China Sea. This is really hotting up. It's been going on for some time now. Given that, do you see things improving between the two countries in, in, in the years ahead? I have to say I've become less optimistic after doing this project than I did before doing it. Because I was growing up with a quite favorable attitude towards Japan in 1980s, 1990s. We were quite you know, familiar with Japanese pop culture, so it's quite a you know, pleasant feeling towards that country. But after this trip, I realized that the, the gap of understanding between the two countries, between politicians and public, are much deeper than I ever thought. So I'm not 100% optimistic about the future between these two countries in terms of political tensions. However, I think between the publics, between the younger generations, there's still a chance because we have these cultural similarities between each other. But the starting point that we both need to dig into the history and face the, 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 the truth, the fact happening in history, both in China and in Japan, and that's a starting point for mutual understanding, and that's exactly what, what, what we have been trying to do.